course, uh, and especially this week, I would like to start by acknowledging that SFU, the Seagull building that we are here, is on the unceded traditional uh, territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam Nation. Um, welcome to the sixth annual uh, Edward and Emily McQueenie uh, Memorial, Memorial Lecture that will bring us uh, Tatris Kalivas uh, from Oxford University to talk about uh, democratic resilience. Edward and Emily McWinney uh, Memorial Lecture was established in 2017 uh, and uh, to, to honor the memory of two friends and supporters of the Hellenic study at Simon Fraser University devoted to contemporary and issues of global interest. Um, and this is an aspect of the lecture that really uh, fits in line with uh, Edward McWinney's uh, life and career. Edward was a, um, a one leading scholar in terms of Canadian um, constitution. He was a prolific academic. He held um, professorship at many famous institution like Yale, La Sorbonne, Toronto, University of Toronto, uh, McGill, and the best one of all, Simon Fraser University. <laughs> he wrote many books. Uh, he advised many international uh, entities like the United Nations, the Canadian government, uh, foreign and other foreign government. But he didn't stop there. He also got involved in public policy. He served two terms as a member of the parliament. Uh, and this is this commitment to both academic and public policy that, uh, that, that this public lecture right now is commemorating. Um, and it's part of a well-established annual le uh, lecture series, along with the McWinney Professorship House in the Department of Global Human Humanity. Um, tonight's lecture is organized by the Stravros Narsios Foundation, Center for Hellenic Study, uh, and it's to support some public discussion on topics that would have interest Professor McQueenie intellectual life. The SNF Center uh, for Hellenic Study was founded in 2011 uh, by a generous, a generous uh, uh, grant, uh, and the research center is, uh, is there to support researchers and, um, and faculty and student uh, on issues related to the history and the culture uh, of Greece. The SNF Center for Elect Study is housed in the Faculty of Art and Social Science uh, and is closely uh, interacting with the Department of Humanity where most of the faculty are housed. On behalf of the Faculty of Art and Social Science at Simon Fraser University, thank you for attending the lecture. And I will now introduce Dimitri Kralis, the director of the center, to uh, formally introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, dear friends of uh, Hellenic studies, friends of Greece, it's culture and uh, history. Uh, it's great to have you uh, here. As uh, director uh, of uh, the SNF Center for uh, Hellenic Studies, I'm uh, thrilled to be greeting you. And uh, uh, as we prepare to contemplate uh, uh, with our speaker the specific uh, and focused topic of uh, Greek politics and the more broadly uh, relevant and burning question of the survival of democracies, in periods of acute uh, social and economic upheaval. Uh, before we uh, get to our talk, though, a few words on the center, the speaker series, and uh, Professor Kalivas. He asked me to keep the last part of it short, so I'm going to try to stick to that, hard as, as it might be. Uh, now, uh, those of you who have been with us and have followed the activities of the SNF Center for uh, Hellenic Studies for uh, the 11 years of its uh, existence will know that these types of topics are very much uh, of interest to our uh, community of Hellenists uh, and our audiences. Uh, we have over the years sought to tackle them by way of uh, two, many two, two main avenues. On the one hand, we organize an always fresh academic speaker series uh, at uh, SFU up on Burnaby uh, Mountain. And this series is mostly uh, attended uh, by colleagues and, uh, and students, though I must say, uh, courtesy of the pandemic and uh, 
our introduction to uh, Zoom, uh, that community has been uh, opened up in the past uh, uh, two years. Uh, this uh, seminar series is kind of buttressed by uh, select uh, wider audience uh, events, such as the one uh, we're attending uh, today. Over the years, the McQueenie uh, talks have hosted uh, uh, scholars such as uh, Lucas Tsoukalis from the University of Athens, Dimitri Papadimitriou from the University of Manchester, Haris Milonas from George Washington uh, University. Uh, and our, pre our previous speakers came to us um, in uh, what was uh, post-2008, a, a tricky period. So uh, in the context of a financial and eventually a political crisis, uh, there was a, a opportunity to deal with questions of uh, uh, the, relating to the Greek experience in European institutional and global contexts, uh, but also with questions of uh, charisma, the practice of politics, uh, and even uh, very current uh, in today's Russia-inflected uh, uh, context, uh, questions of the relevance of, uh, of the West. Now, uh, the, the center over the years has also engaged with politics uh, uh, quite directly. Uh, we do not believe that academia is a space for detachment and isolation for politics. Uh, and uh, so over the years, uh, uh, some of you may have uh, attended the uh, uh, events where uh, figures from uh, the Greek political world have come in, people of all stripes, from uh, the, the now, well, defunct and trying to get back on the horse, uh, uh, Pasok, uh, to uh, the Syriza when they were coming to power, uh, even uh, before he was uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Kostas uh, Mitsotakis. So uh, the center has been trying to foster this uh, wider engagement with, uh, the, with Greek affairs. Uh, today, however, we pivot back to academic reflection by way of someone who, over the years, has carved uh, uh, a special place for himself, for himself as an actively engaged thinker on uh, uh, Greek uh, current affairs and, uh, and history. Uh, tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Stathis Kalivas, Gladstone Professor of uh, uh, Government and uh, uh, Fellow at All Souls uh, College at the University of uh, uh, Oxford, uh, is uh, very well known both for his work on uh, uh, on, uh, on modern Greece uh, specifically and uh, its history and current affairs, uh, but also uh, among uh, uh, people who study syllabi of political science department as a writer of uh, essential uh, works uh, uh, in uh, uh, the world of uh, uh, political science. Uh, and this is my attempt to keep, to keep it short. Um, I, I should like to say, and I think that this is relevant uh, to uh, today's talk and uh, uh, today's event, uh, that uh, very recently, uh, uh, Professor Kalivas uh, uh, worked uh, uh, with uh, a constellation of uh, uh, scholars uh, uh, and experts from Greece on a documentary series, uh, which, uh, if, you ha if, you, if you can understand Greek, uh, you should try to uh, engage with, uh, which aired at uh, uh, Sky uh, in, uh, in Greece on the history of the modern uh, Greek state. Uh, I think the series is uh, a, a really interesting piece of public scholarship, um, both in terms of the story uh, it weaves on, uh, uh, on, the, on the history of modern uh, Greece uh, and the modern Greek experience, but also in the exposure it gives to uh, core players in uh, the construction of the various disciplines that allow us to understand uh, Greece. So uh, I wanted to emphasize that aspect as a uh, we, uh, we engage with uh, his ideas uh, uh, today. And without further ado, I'll invite him uh, to the podium. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. It's a great honor to be invited uh, by the center uh, and to have the opportunity to visit Vancouver after um, about uh, 10 to 12 years I was here um, some time ago, but it seems the city has changed enormously, so it's a great opportunity to revisit that. And of course, after COVID, it's always a pleasure to be able to travel and to meet people in person. So um, I'm going to share some reflections today about um, democratic resilience, how democracy survive in the face uh, of enormous challenges. This, it, it, this is a topic that um, occupies a lot of minds, and it also happens to be uh, something that we witnessed uh, uh, from very close by uh, through the Greek crisis. So I'm going to um, uh, have a lot of facts uh, on, on the slides, but I'm going to try to be um, as brief as I can. But it's, it's, a, um, it's a complicated topic, uh, 
to try to cover uh, altogether. The reason why Greece is interesting uh, during uh, the period, especially between 2008, 2009, and the beginning in 2015, which is the climax of the crisis, is because it experienced a huge economic shock. We'll see how huge it was. Uh, and it was not just a Greek crisis, even though it was expressed in Greece, uh, it captured a number of uh, forces uh, that were international, global uh, in scope, uh, and more particularly European as well. Uh, the crisis in Greece, in a sense, raised questions about the viability of the common European currency, and therefore uh, of the European Union as a viable project. Um, and it also threatened the very um, uh, character of the country, its political regime, its ability uh, to make uh, economic progress and to grow uh, its very stature um, uh, in terms of its past and its future. Uh, if we go back to that period, you will see that a lot of people made very pessimistic predictions. This is probably one of the most outrageous ones, but it was not exceptional. A lot of people thought that it was, almost, it was going to be almost certain that Greece was going to exit the Euro, and many people thought that this would cause such a disruption as to threaten uh, the very democratic regime of the country. Uh, and in fact, if you look at uh, uh, a variety of predictions by, for example, banks and financial institutions, the expectations are very dire. I remember meeting with economists uh, back in 2013 and people um, looking at me uh, with um, a sense of sadness about what uh, was expected to uh, to happen uh, to the country. And this was, the Greek crisis was, in a way, uh, something that uh, led me to pay more attention to Greek politics uh, and eventually led to some of these activities that Dimitris described before the documentary series and other things. My, my work as a political scientist is to study conflict, the kinds of things that normally you don't expect uh, to find violent conflict, you don't expect to find in advanced democracies. And suddenly I was confronted with the possibility that my specialization was going to um, be observed uh, in the country uh, where I come from. So it was very, very disturbing. Uh, at the same time, especially after the election of Donald Trump uh, as president of the United States, a literature began to emerge in political science uh, with a variety of titles about, in a sense, uh, the end or the dangers uh, that Western democracies face. Uh, and the idea that, in fact, we could no longer assume uh, that democracy was the regime of the future uh, and may become, in fact, the regi a regime of the past. So there was a lot of concern. And so uh, uh, these two uh, kind of tendencies met uh, with the Greek crisis. And so the question I would like to address today is how these democracies, and I'm going to refer to mature democracies, and Greece, uh, for all its travails, used to be and continues to be a democracy with um, a long democratic tradition and a parliamentary tradition that goes back to the 19th century, something that people very often forget. How do they manage to absorb the type of shock uh, that Greece experienced? And the idea is that uh, we can learn from the experience of Greece. Uh, and especially we can perhaps uh, derive a bit more optimism about the democratic uh, future of the world than today uh, prevails. Um, we do know the answer uh, to the question of whether uh, Greece was going to survive both within the Eurozone by keeping the common European currency and by being a democratic regime. Uh, it did survive, but we don't really have thought seriously about how and why it did so. Uh, one of the problems that social scientists very often share with journalists is once the danger goes away, uh, interest goes down. Um, and I'm going to mention that uh, because uh, one needs to understand what the source uh, of pessimistic uh, predictions is. Um, these days, uh, there is a lot of discussion about uh, the elections in Italy, uh, which brought to power uh, a party, among others, a coalition of parties, but a party that is uh, the descendant of, of the uh, neo-fascist party in Italy, and so the, there's similar dire predictions. So perhaps what I'm going to say today applies perhaps uh, more widely. 
So why uh, pessimist in, in faces of uh, major crisis? Well, the first and most obvious uh, thing is the magnitude of the crisis, but I'm going to, to speak about some other causes as well. Uh, news bias, poor historical analogies, what they call projection bias, and then two basic misunderstandings, uh, both of the European integration process and how democracy actually works. And I'm going to focus the second half of my lecture based basically on the last point. So very quickly, this was a very, very big crisis. Uh, if you see uh, those charts, you will see here, for example, that compared to all the other countries that experienced crisis during the same period, Greece really stands out in terms of its loss of GDP. Almost 30% of its GDP went in the air. It's an enormous cost. Uh, if you compare Greece to the United States, you see that Greece experienced a similar decline than the US Great Depression back in the 1920s and 30s without actually climbing back. Uh, and if you see the period in which Greece experienced the GDP loss, you see that it covers the period roughly from, from 2008 to 2014. So it was very, uh, the duration of, of the losses was actually quite great. And, and that was followed by uh, stagnation after that. Uh, and if you compare Greece to major crises uh, with similar kinds of mixes in places like Mexico or Argentina, it was even worse than that as well, in terms of magnitude. So we're speaking about something that was pretty exceptional. No uh, advanced democracy had experienced such an economic shock. And therefore, what happened to Greece is in a sense a kind of an experiment. Not a controlled experiment, uh, but a situation that allows us at least to try to extract uh, some um, lessons from it. But there are other reasons that are less good in terms of the pessimistic predictions. And this one obvious one is what I call the news bias. Nobody talks about Greece today because Greece has survived. Its economy is doing better. Its institutions for all their problems operate in a democratic setting. And as a result, it has disappeared. So there is, a, as you know, a bias to emphasize bad news and not to return uh, to try to understand how countries, very much like individuals, overcome uh, those obstacles. There is also a tendency uh, to go back to the worst periods uh, of European history in order to make sense of any crisis of some magnitude that hits. Uh, this is a quote, and I'm going to show you where it comes from, that makes a lot of sense. It says that a government that shuts down banks, introduces capital controls, and declares partial default in the middle of a deep slump has little chance of surviving. And the term government here is not used to describe just the government, but also a regime. And this is a statement that comes from a description of the processes that led to the emergence of Nazism and Hitler in Germany during the 1930s. And I say that it is a poor analogy because it's a very facile, a very easy one. It's always, whenever there is a crisis, uh, people go back in the uh, European interwar years and suddenly you can see um, Hitler arrives. Uh, and uh, even though there may be good reasons for making these arguments, uh, the reasons are never so good that you can only make that as a prediction. Projection bias is the tendency to read uh, events in a place uh, and project onto them your own concerns and perhaps obsessions. And this is very uh, often what happened to the interpretations of the Greek crisis, not just by journalists, but also by very, very serious and very famous scholars. Uh, people who were very much concerned about the Euro uh, and feared uh, that the Euro is not a viable currency, saw the Greek crisis as an opportunity uh, to, uh, in a sense, push their interpretation about the end of the euro. So therefore, they predicted that Greece was, in a sense, the straw that was going to, bro to break the camel's back. Uh, the same is true about people uh, who thought the eurozone was not institutionally a viable entity, or even the European Union, per se. Many people in the United States, for example, argued that you cannot possibly have uh, a political entity with um, uh, including states with such a different, different political culture and political outlook, uh, like, for example, Greece, um, 
and Germany in the same union. Uh, but also people uh, who traffic in civilizational arguments uh, saw the opportunity to make arguments about the end of European civilization or the end of Western Europe as a powerful entity in the world. Uh, others saw the end of capitalism in what was happening in Greece. Others uh, thought that uh, the Greek crisis was a good opportunity to critique, for example, the policies of the Republican Party. So they projected their critique of the Republican Party onto uh, the policies of Germany, for example. Others thought that it was a good opportunity to push for Brexit. Uh, and you can find many reasons. So that very often, interpretations and explanations reflect more the concerns of the interpreter than the um, uh, specifics of the situation. I'll give you uh, just one example, um, an article that makes the case for why, by Louis de Bernier, who's actually uh, a very well-known uh, fiction writer, known for his book, uh, Corelli's Mandolin, which is a fantastic book overall, but he argued that he became a fan of Brexit because of his um, interpretation of what was happening in Greece. Uh, I suspect it's the other way around. Uh, and this is a slew of incredibly serious economists, two of whom are uh, Nobel Prize winners. So Danny Roderick from Harvard, Paul Krugman that you all know, Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia, and Joe Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winner uh, from Columbia as well. They all predicted that Greece was not going to uh, remain in the Eurozone and uh, even that the Eurozone was going to collapse. Uh, so that shows that even very serious people can make mistakes in terms of their predictions. Um, and I think the roots for the mistakes, especially of this last group of people, comes from their um, lack of deeper understanding of the European integration process, which I think is one of the most uh, challenging, but also interesting and fascinating political experiments of our era, it's very easy to forget that because the European integration process, especially if you learn about it in a classroom, is one of the most boring uh, courses that you can possibly take. Uh, it's fraught with details and acronyms. But in fact, it's a fascinating experiment on creating a new entity out of existing states. Uh, now, in times of economic crisis, people also focus very much on economics, and that makes a lot of sense. But it also meant that people forgot that the European integration politics was primarily a process about politics. Uh, and it had a legacy that came very much uh, from political disasters that were never completely forgotten. Um, so I think uh, we need to temper those two twin assumptions, the emphasis on economics and the emphasis on, on the economic origins and the economic functions of the European Union and emphasize instead the political dimension uh, of the European integration process, and especially of the Euro. Uh, it is hard to think of a currency, which after all is a means of financial exchange, uh, just as um, a political process, but it is fundamentally a very political process. Uh, as I mentioned, the origins of the European integration process go back to the Second World War and the disasters it brought. Uh, it was imagined uh, and brought to life by people who were primarily motivated by the idea of eliminating war from the European continent. But because this is a very lofty and difficult objective to achieve, they started with something that was very prosaic and that was coal. So they created an economic entity of um, coal trading which then gradually expanded on a variety of other economic aspects. And in fact, uh, they did so because of the big problem of sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty is like property. Uh, if you have it, you don't give it up. You want to keep it. And the problem with the European experiment is that it requires that sovereign states give up a very big part of their sovereignty to a new entity. And they're not, never going to do it with their own will. So in a sense, the uh, framers, the founders of the European idea uh, came up uh, with um, a very interesting plan, which was both incremental uh, and also um, smart, clever. Uh, so the European, the Eurozone crisis was a political crisis uh, because, in a sense, the Eurozone, the currency unification, the adoption of a common European uh, 
um, currency uh, by the European states was an incomplete project. You had states sharing a common currency, but not sharing a common, for example, framework for fiscal policy or for banks, for example. And that created an enormous tension uh, so that you could not, for example, expect at the time of the crisis the European Central Bank to act uh, very much like, for example, uh, the Central Bank of England acted in the last couple of days by buying debt in order to bring the pressure uh, on uh, the British pound down. That was not possible at the uh, outset of the crisis and it was very much fought against by specific states within the European Union, especially Germany. Uh, so the idea, in a sense, uh, of the European integration process is to create incremental changes that nobody very often thinks very much about when they're signed on, which, however, become very difficult to reverse. And my favorite example here is the uh, airplane analogy or metaphor. It's one thing to decide whether you want to get into, inside an airplane and travel. It's a very different thing to change your mind once the airplane is in the air. And I think that describes the euro. Once you decide to join the euro, which you can decide to do or not, uh, but once you decide to join it, you cannot easily quit. And I think the Greek example exemplifies that. Uh, and there is a very nice uh, quote by Helmut Kohl, who, who was one of the uh, uh, people who, in, in a sense, pushed for, for this um, uh, process uh, of unification, when he said that if you create uh, the euro, it's going to, in a sense, become a fact that's so fundamental that nobody will be able to reverse it without destroying the entire structure. And I think this, is, this was an illustration of what we see. And of course, given the stakes, that changes very much the calculations of the actors. Um, the thing to keep in mind um, about Greece is also that people underestimated in a very fundamental way what the European project meant for Greece. Uh, and if you look at the map here, uh, in 1981, Greece became the first new member of the European community at the time to join in. And you can see uh, what is remarkable about this map is how disconnected and how far away Greece is compared to the core of Europe. And I don't mean that from a cultural perspective, but from a geographic perspective. And so you could say that Greece in, it, in its course of its modern history has always sought to escape its geography. And it's very natural to try to escape it because the neighborhood in Greece, in which Greece is located is a very dangerous neighborhood, uh, has always been a very dangerous one. So for Greece, the connection to the core of Europe has been an aspiration that has had uh, an existential dimension. Um, and this is something that a lot of analysts missed, the extent to which for both political elites especially, but also for a large percentage of the Greek population, the European project was never about the economy. It was about politics and about identity. Uh, and what is very interesting to also discuss uh, is even the process of the creation of the modern Greek state in the 19th century was very much an intellectual pro project that was uh, very heavily influenced by the idea of Western Europe and trying to associate Greece with Western Europe. <laughs> Therefore, every threat to that position was going to be, um, in a sense, dealt uh, with, with a lot of care, uh, much more than people uh, gave credit to Greece. And I think this is a factor that explains some of the things that I'm going to discuss later on. But, I would like to emphasize another dimension which I think is very important and very often missed, which is the misunderstanding of how democracy actually works versus what we think democracy is. And to do that, I have unfortunately to take you through a very um, brief um, summary of the events of that decade, and I'm sorry if you know them, uh, and I'm also sorry to the people who don't know them very well and it's going to feel very compressed I'm going to try to do it in just four slides, and I call it a play in four acts. The first act was the subprime crisis in 2008, which basically generated the crisis that created everything we're going to see. It spread globally. Uh, it reached um, Europe very quickly. 
Uh, that led to the reassessment of borrowing risk. Suddenly, everyone who had, in a sense, paid the price for the subprime crisis, meaning banks and markets, started looking at debt, sovereign debt, and started being very worried about it. They shouldn't. They should have paid attention beforehand, but they don't, usually. And that led uh, to um, attention to the cost, uh, to, to, to the Greek debt, which was quite high, and the Greek deficit, which was also, also high, quite high. And as a result, the ability of Greece to refinance its debt on the market started to become more difficult, very much like what, was, what is happening these days uh, with the UK. That is, the cost of raising money from the markets in order to finance your debt becomes very high. The country was led at the time by a center-right government, which didn't want, uh, in a sense, to deal with the problem and decided to call elections. These were the first elections of, of the crisis era. Uh, that ele those elections contributed to the explosion of the deficit, because when you do elections, in a sense, at best, you don't pay attention to your fiscal uh, institutions. At worst, you try to distribute money. So uh, it created uh, a bigger problem, which was compounded by the fact that the other main party of the Greek political system, the center-left party, uh, also downplayed the, pro the, the, the problem. Uh, and when it came to power, discovered that, in fact, the situation was much worse than it expected. And that created a new sort of big problem uh, that brought to um, existence the term of Greek statistics, the fact that the uh, official statistics of, of Greece were actually uh, not reflecting the underlying situation. Uh, financial markets freaked out. The spreads, that is the difference between the interest that Greece was paying for its debt compared to that of Germany, increased, and Greece couldn't basically refinance its debt. It meant that it was going to go bankrupt. But it couldn't go bankrupt like that because it had a currency that was not just its own, but it was European. And nobody understood or could make sense at the time of the concept of defaulting within the euro. It was, it's a very difficult concept to make sense of. Uh, and so that created a paralysis that exacerbated the crisis and also became a self-fulfilling prophecy because the markets started to believe that Europe couldn't possibly do the kinds of things you expect a sovereign state to do. That is, in a sense, intervene as a central bank because that was excluded from the Maastricht Treaty. And it was excluded because it meant that if a single member defaulted, everyone else would have to pay for it. And that was something that nobody wanted. Which br brings us to the rescue, which was fraught uh, eventually, the European, the Eurozone decided they had to intervene because the cost of not intervening was higher. It's the airport, the, the airplane analogy that was higher, but they, they were not willing to do what it took. So every stage, in a sense, was in a sense to push, to push them to do something that they hated doing. They created an ad hoc setup with three institutions, including they brought in the, the IMF because they had never done uh, a a sort of rescue program. Uh, it was the biggest, most expensive financial rescue in modern financial history. And it also called for the largest fiscal adjustment problem, program. Uh, a fiscal adjustment program is basically you have to cut all spending in order to be able, uh, in a sense, to show that you're serious about your debt and your deficit. But if you do that, in a sense, you may destroy your economy at the same time. So it was a program that we know now was pretty poorly planned and poorly executed uh, because it was meant primarily as a signaling to the markets rather than as a proper program of uh, economic adjustment, which created additional panic. And as a result, the crisis spread to other European countries. So it, it almost brought the euro to collapse. Uh, and that forced a second bailout on Greece with the biggest debt write-off in history. It was a negotiated default. Almost 50% of Greek debt, uh, in a sense, was given away. 
But the problem was that a lot of that debt was owned by Greek institutions. Greek banks, for example, were wiped out because they had a lot of this debt on their papers. And it was also the largest fiscal adju adjustment in modern history. Um, as a result of that, the Greek economy came to a standstill. It, it was a shock therapy that almost killed the patient. The emphasis on, on the almost. Third act, the political consequences of that. When a country undergoes this kind of crisis, it creates a lot of unhappiness, and that's a very natural reaction. There was mass discontent in Greece. People didn't trust the main political parties because nobody had prepared them for what has, was going to happen. And in fact, the same parties were not in a position to deal with the problem. Every time that new legislation was brought in the parliament, a lot of the MPs of those major parties would defect because they were not willing to vote for such unpopular measures. That led to the, uh, a technocratic government uh, that managed to do the debt uh, write off but was not willing to continue. Elections were called in 2012. The first of those elections produced no results. Second elections followed. The party system imploded. I'm going to describe that. New extreme parties emerged, including a neo-Nazi party, uh, which was probably one of the most extreme neo-Nazi parties in Europe, uh, which came to poll around 10%. Uh, new coalition government was formed, didn't manage to stop the crisis, but then, uh, the ECB, the European Central Bank, stabilized the crisis by doing what every central bank does, claiming that it would spend and would print as much money as necessary in order to stop the crisis, something that everyone had resisted at the, at, at, until that point. Uh, and as a result, the Greek economy stabilized. It didn't regain uh, what it had lost, at least, but at least it stopped the bleeding. But the political crisis continued to fester. Elections were called in December 2014, and that leads us to my final timeline crisis. Uh, a very strange coalition government that brought together a radical left and a radical right party emerged on the mandate to get rid of austerity, of the fiscal adjustment. But getting rid of the fiscal adjustment would mean that Greece would have, in a sense, to, for, uh, to, to refuse to, you know, new um, to refuse rescue funds, which would lead it, force it, in a sense, to, to exit the Eurozone. Uh, so there was a, a, an incredible tension around the promises of the government and the idea that you could keep the Euro uh, in one, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in, its, in its former shape and also to keep Greece within the Euro. Uh, there were negotiations between Greece um, and the various institutions about the content of the fiscal adjustment, they failed. A referendum was called in July 2015. Everyone held their breath. Uh, Greeks rejected austerity, who wouldn't, uh, by a very large majority. But when the moment of truth came, the government decided to do a U-turn and accept to, in a sense, continue with policies of austerity. Uh, new elections were called. The same radical coalition won with an austerity program. I'm going to return to that. That led to political stabilization. GDP losses stopped. There was uh, some GDP growth. And as a result, Greece disappeared from the news. And this is where I come to tell you the story of exactly what happened and what it all means. This is to a very nice uh, graph that shows uh, the uh, escalation, especially in 2012, uh, these, these are the interest rates for Greek debt. How much someone would pay in order to buy Greek debt, which means calculation of the risk. And you see, in a sense, the twin peaks of 2012 and 2015. And this is a confidence index uh, that goes until the present. The second dip is the COVID crisis. So you see how the, you know, the Greek crisis was almost, and, and from a cumulative perspective, it was a loss of confidence that was comparable to what COVID caused in most economies. So the question here is how did Greece manage this kind of shock? Especially how did its politics manage that? Is it a question of norms and preferences? Do people change their preferences? Eventually they do, 
but they don't change their preferences because people tell them the situation is dire and you have to adapt. Nobody wants to change and adapt, even in the face of evidence that things are very bad. Is it a matter of institutions? Greece, as I mentioned, is a country with very old parliamentary institutions and a very solid democratic tradition since 1974 at least. But like many countries that are democratic, uh, with a deficit in democratic trust, people in surveys say they don't trust their institutions, they don't trust politicians. Uh, I think in order for us to make sense of what happened, we have to move away from our perception of what democracy is, which very often overlaps with what democracy should be, and how democracy actually operates in practice. And so I'm going to give you my perception of what I think democracy is in practice, which is to some extent the result of my observation of the way things work out, worked out in Greece. Uh, I don't think democracy, as practiced, right, not as a an ideal is about the expression, the unconstrained expression of the popular will. Because the popular will very often uh, finds itself at odds with bad realities. It's, not, it's neither the, ex the expression of popular sovereignty, at least in, on a continuous way. Popular sovereignty is expressed in elections, but not in policies. Uh, it's not a foolproof solution to grievances. Very often people use the term democracy in order to refer to ideal solutions. It's not street action, revolution, or violence. In fact, democracy is a political technology to make conflict non-violent. What is it then? I would argue very often people mention democratic legitimacy. If you see uh, how democratic legitimacy is measured, you will probably reach the conclusion that there isn't a lot of democratic legitimacy around because people don't trust institutions in general. However, there is a second concept which makes us, force us to ground the idea of democratic legitimacy, to make it very pedestrian, but also much more easily understandable. And this is the concept of accountability. And the basic idea behind, behind accountability is that people have the opportunity to punish incumbents when they perceive that the governments in power don't do their job properly. And the mechanism that, in a sense, translates accountability into practice um, is elections. So my argument is, is fairly simple. Democracy is about, obviously, about legitimacy. But legitimacy really means accountability. And accountability really means elections. So democracy is really about elections. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate that with a Greek case. Economic shocks force in a sense, the voters, or induce the voters to punish incumbents, but also in extreme situations, they also punish the opposition as well. Imagine a situation in the United States in which voters vote Republicans and Democrats both out of power. This is what happened in Greece, right? Uh, and it's best exemplified by politics of developing nations. When Argentina experienced a very big crisis in 2001, the slogan in the street was que se vayan todos, let them all go home, right? That was the spirit in Greece, that everyone is equally corrupt or incompetent. We have to get rid of everyone. But what happens when you do that? Well, what happens is that you get incredible opportunities for new players to enter politics, for political outsiders, also known as populists, but very often, those political outsiders tend to be former insiders disguised as outsiders. Um, Donald Trump was a political outsider, but from an economic and social perspective, he was clearly not an outsider. He was a member of the establishment. And so people have the incentive to portray themselves as outsiders in order to capitalize on the disgust and the rejection that people feel about the insiders. And so politics of polarization and outrage, which have become very common across democratic nations, are a very common um, occurrence under those circumstances. Uh, in a sense, populism, you could say, is a rational political response, not a rational economic one, but politically, it's a rational response for times uh, of economic failure or discontent.
But the problem is what, hum what happens exactly when the populists win. And this is where the democracy, the, how democracies die argument comes in. People assume very often that a victory of populists means the end of democratic politics. And this is not what happened in Greece. What happened in Greece was something very different. The traditional parties got gutted. As I said, their MPs defected. There were a lot of street protests. The traditional parties collapsed. The populists were voted in. And then they had to deal with a problem. And they discovered that they face the same constraints. You cannot legislate reality away. So they had to deliver. Uh, and this is where you collude with reality. And there are three paths when you face this kind of situation. One path is to subvert democracy uh, through military coup or self-coup or something else. Another path is to try to flee, to go for broke, to, in a sense, try to implement your agenda. But then the problem is you face an enormous risk and you will be held accountable for that risk. So if the Greek government had implement, implemented a policy of Brexit, that would have, uh, in a sense, ushered an enormous humanitarian crisis and the first to pay the price would be the people responsible for it. Uh, and the third is to compromise. And that, in a sense, is my argument. People very often assume that populists will subvert, but in mature democracies, the costs of subverting are very high because mature democracies tend to be wealthier. So people have a lot to lose. In terms of the politics of compromise, one of the most striking things about the Greek crisis is that the more outsiders were getting in parliament, the more uh, Greeks experienced financial pain, the more the parliament voted for fiscal adjustment. So the first bailout agreement by the Socialist Party was voted by 172 MPs out of 300. The second one, which was harder, by 199 because now you had all the mainstream parties banding together in the face of the impos impossibility of not doing so. The third one, you also had the radicals in. The populists voted in favor. So every time fiscal pain increased, every time accountability was triggered, eventually support for fiscal measures increased. Exactly the opposite of what you would expect. Um, and it was not just about representatives. It was about the electorate per se. And I'm going to illustrate that with very simple slides. Uh, in June 27, and, and this is a situation in which time is measured by days, not by years, uh, the prime minister called a referendum asking people to reject austerity. The referendum was called a few days later, July 5th, 61% rejected austerity. 15th of July, the government executes a new turn and does exactly the opposite of what it called the electorate to vote against and actually signs for an austerity package. And on the 20th of September, it, got, it gets voted in by the same voters who supported this policy of rejecting fiscal accountability fiscal uh, measures. So you can see how the mechanism of elections changes the behavior of elected representatives, but also changes the behavior of the electorate per se, because when the politicians and eventually the very large uh, cross-section of the politicians tells them that there is no other choice, people, in a sense, conform to that. And what is very striking about those 10 years of the crisis is the proliferation of elections. During that period, there were six national elections, two European elections, one referendum, almost one electoral process per year. And it is true that calling elections all the time is extremely messy. It contributes to political and to economic instability, and it contributes to the rise of polarization. But at the same time, and this is what people forget, it's an enormous mechanism of compromise and of adjustment. Uh, and this is what one of the leading st students of democracy, Adam Chevorsky, calls, in a sense, the miracle of democracy. Elections are the mechanisms through which democracies face these kinds of shocks. And we tend to um, not to pay enough attention to elections, and a lot of political theorists 
think that elections are just, um, in a sense, the, um, uh, the sort of superficial mechanism for the expression of, of popular will, and democracy should be something very different. But I do believe that eventually elections are the key institution I'll show you two slides with just a little bit of data. Uh, what happened since uh, is the reconstitution of the Greek party system that imploded in 2012. So what you see is that in 2009, 77% of the voters supported the two main parties. We go back to 2019, 71% of the voters support the two main parties. So the Greek party system, which was a two-party system, collapsed in 2012 and has reconstituted itself in pretty much a similar form. The only difference is that although the, the party of the center right is the same, the party of the center left has shifted. It's no longer the socialist party, it's the former party of the radical left. But if you go to the beautiful island of Crete, which I very much advise you to visit, which was a stronghold of the socialist party, you will uh, see a remarkable phenomenon. If you look at the elections in 2009, you will see that the majority vote for the Socialist Party, almost 60%, and a very small minority vote for the radical left. You go to the elections after 2012, you see exactly the opposite. So the same people shifted parties. And eventually the party, the Socialist Party, was transformed through this process. It was a process of hostile takeover of a party, very much like what Trump tries to do with the Republicans. So how democracy survive? Very briefly, I argued that democracies have an ability to absorb shocks that is remarkable, that is not endless, but is much more pronounced than people give them credit for and that the way they do so is through elections. Elections produce legitimacy in practice through accountability. And they open the door to uncompromising outsiders who eventually compromise, which is how democratic institutions survive. So in a sense, and this is how I'm going to conclude, that leads us to a very interesting phenomenon which would be uh, interesting to explore and discuss further, what may be described as a democratic paradox, which is that democracies often appear extremely vulnerable. When you compare democracies to autocracies, what you see is basically a process of anarchy. Parties losing elections, new parties emerging out of nowhere, elections happening all the time, people being polarized, a mess and a mayhem. And so that leads people uh, like the Chinese prime minister or the Russian prime minister to say that democracies are not viable. But what happens is that this precise weakness, this precise vulnerability is what makes democracies so nimble and so resilient. Unlike autocratic systems, which when faced with enormous crisis, very often collapsed. So it's the weakness of democracy that makes its strength. And I think the Greek example is a very nice illustration of that observation. So thank you very much for your attention. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, what was, uh, at least for me, a very clarifying uh, uh, experience because I obviously followed all this and I had ideas about this, but uh, the whole uh, focus on, uh, on elections and the way that they actually produce eventually a form of consensus uh, was, uh, was truly fascinating. Uh, for the logistics of uh, what we're doing right now, uh, there is a microphone that is uh, floating uh, in, in the hands of Wallace in, uh, in the back uh, for uh, people who would like to ask questions. Uh, I would like you to uh, wait, if possible, for Wallace to come to you with a microphone because this would allow us to properly record your question. Otherwise, uh, it won't be registered in uh, for posterity. And uh, with that, uh, uh, we'll pass it uh, uh, to you.
to, to, to our audience. Happy day. I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to balance the microphone with the clicker, which was especially the, the light of the projector that was the tra crisis. Thank you very much for a great uh, talk and explicating a lot. My first question is uh, um, how much of an influence does the coherence inside the nation state at the level of populace influence these processes? Because I'm thinking about states that have a kind of a centrifugal um, makeup. I'm Italian, so uh, we are <laughs> very regionalist. <laughs> but even uh, Great Britain, uh, you know, the pushes for uh, independence. So many situations inside Europe always have to contend also with internal forces at the level of uh, regionality, etc. So is uh, the case of Greece also exceptional, perhaps, uh, because uh, it is a more coherent kind of, or is it a coherent kind of nation state? I'm not completely sure, or not. Uh, and uh, the, the parallel that you were making, for example, with uh, uh, Trump taking over, basically, the Republican uh, Party, this would be my second question how much uh, uh, the example of Greece uh, would uh, de facto illuminate uh, the uh, specific circumstances of what is going on in the United States? Well, I'll start, uh, thank you very much. I'll start with the second uh, question. I would say the biggest difference between European politics and American politics is uh, the personalization of politics because of the presidential nature of American politics and the parliamentary nature of European politics. And one of the... Uh, of the, of the strengths of the American political system, if you want to call it that way, is that parties are very adaptable, especially through the mechanism of primaries that allow outsiders, in a sense, to capture them. But at the same time, they are very elusive, elusive uh, because you can capture them as a person and you can endorse candidates, but that doesn't mean that there is an institution, an institutional mechanism to control. So on the one hand, it's very easy to capture a party. Not easy, but it's possible to capture a party. But once you've captured it, it doesn't mean that you have the ability to control who gets in and out. It's all adjudicated by elections. So I would say that um, on the one hand, that makes the American system easier to subvert by, by outsiders who have a lot of resources, especially through the primaries. But on the other hand, it makes very difficult to translate that capture into, into an institutional legacy in the way you can see in a parliamentary system in which once you have, in a sense, you control the mechanism, the, the machine, as it used to be known, then you can control the party, even if you don't win elections. Uh, on the first question, I would say that Greece is uh, ethnically more homogenous. There, there, there is no region that tries to, in a sense, become independent. But I would say the main threats for democracy in Europe, especially the interwar years, for example, have not come from uh, these kinds of centrifugal factors. They've come more from the traditional politics of left versus right. And I would say the biggest um, way, the biggest cleavage, if you want, in the way politics is organized in Europe, which reflects, in a sense, trends in America and elsewhere, is between uh, what may be described as, uh, on the one hand, the losers of globalization or people threatened by the openness of the economy uh, and the arrival of immigrants, for example, and people who are doing better economically, or the politics of the cities versus the countryside. Uh, you, you have in many countries a similar kind of, of process, and this is what gives the, the politics of polarization uh, its actual depth. And, and, and this is what people uh, very often fear as a source of potential breakdown. Hi. Um, so, yeah, thank you for your presentation. That was really fascinating to see how democracies can deal with shocks. I was just uh, wondering for problems where, which have a very long buildup um, and then have a you know, huge shock at the very end, how do, like, are democracies well suited to dealing with the, those sort of problems? Or like, how can democracies be you know, modified or, you know, adjusted, like, how, how do they deal with those? Like, I'm thinking in particular, you know, something like climate change or, you know, 
prevention of that huge debt buildup, which led up to that shock? Uh, you're asking me about um, apocalyptic shocks or perfect storms, and nobody has an answer to that. We don't really know, are there going to be democracies, say, after a nuclear war? Are there going to be democracies after uh, you know, a sort of climate catastrophe on a global scale? We don't really know uh, what the answer is. The only thing I can tell you is given parameters that can be quite extreme but imaginable, democracies appear to be a political regime that has the capacity to absorb and adapt. But anyone who deals with something of apocalyptic proportions is dealing with something that is completely out of the box, and I think it's very difficult to provide a meaningful answer to that question. I wouldn't know what the answer is. David? Hi, um, thanks very much, a, a wonderful talk. Um, in two weeks' time, uh, in British Columbia, we are going to have civic elections, elections at the city level. And I noticed that you were surveying the national elections, you included a European election as well, but um, the mayoral election for Athens, does it matter in this scheme that you're talking about? Well, there is a very large literature in political science about uh, sec so-called second-order elections. And the argument is that in, uh, in those elections in which the fate of the government is not really uh, at stake, that people vote in more frivolous ways, for example. They're not as constrained. Uh, and therefore, that those ele elections usually, but not always, do not play the same, uh, do not have the same political weight. Um, but very often those are connected. In Greece, uh, the politicization of, of the crisis came to a point in which European elections, for example, became extremely meaningful politically. Uh, and so I can imagine situations, I wouldn't know what the politics of British Columbia are, I cannot imagine they're at that point. And therefore I would imagine that these are elections in which the turnout is much lower, uh, the range of candidates is much broader, the connection to some um, cleavage issues may not be as close, and the political relevance in the sense of creating a cascade of uh, processes that lead to um, changes at the top is probably not as big. Appreciate your insights. Wondering if you could perhaps uh, comment on the role of the German banks, uh, in the, their role in the crisis and the the living standards and, and what happened there, uh, especially you know in, into 2015 with um, a large segment of the Greek populace. Well, actually, the banks that were more exp the most exposed to uh, uh, the Greek debt, having bought in a sense Greek bonds, which were losing their value uh, very fast, were not German. They were the French banks. These had the, the biggest exposure, but in general, banks obviously by buying debt. Uh, would found themselves exposed to a situation of um, haircut, uh, as you know, the sort of negotiated default uh, is known. Uh, it, and there is a very complicated process about, you know, who did what and why. And um, my sort of um, general answer would be to be very careful about unicausal responses, because um, what happens in these kinds of processes is that a lot. Uh, of very um, uh, different actors get together to advocate the same thing. So if you look who advocated in favor of a haircut initially and later, uh, that included obviously banks who were standing to lose a lot, but also the Greek state. The Greek state who would stand to gain by having its debt haircut was also standing to lose because it meant the banking sector in Greece would be wiped out. It would mean the pension funds would be wiped out. So the same measure can have different effects overall. Germany reacted to, um, was very careful, uh, disastrously so, uh, when it came to the rescue, not so much in terms of the bank exposure, but because it hated the idea, the German voters hated the idea of mutualized debt. They hated the idea that they would be, in a sense, responsible for paying back uh, the Greek debt. So what happened eventually is a process that is going to lead exactly to that. Uh, the Greek debt is unique in the world 
because its majority today is held by the so-called official sector. What that means is basically Europe, through various entities, controls the Greek debt. It's not owed to banks or to uh, private investors. That means that effectively, depending on your preferences, you can say that Greece has no economic sovereignty anymore because all its debt is owed to a supranational entity. Or you can say that Greece is the first European state to be fully European. <laughs> In a sense, it represents the future. And I believe the, the latter uh, for a very simple reason that I believe that you cannot really have a common currency without mutualized debt. And in fact, the Germans caved in and accepted for the first time mutualized debt with COVID. When Europe actually, the European Commission went on the markets, raised a debt as the European Union, not as a single state, in order to finance pro-COVID uh, and COVID alleviation measures. So eventually, there is going to be a process in which a lot of this debt um, is actually, uh, assuming no apocalyptic outcome or scenario, is going to be never be paid off. It's a, it's, it's a fiction, I think, even where things stand right now. Nick? Thank you for a great lecture. I have one question. Did Greece pay their debts since, 19, since 1800? Greece has a very fraught history when it comes to sovereign debt. Um, its first big um, uh, borrowing happened before it became independent. So during the Greek War of Independence, Greece managed to convince investors of the city of London uh, to lend it money. And of course, given that Greece was not independent yet, it came with, with a very high um, interest rate, a punitive interest rate. Uh, and so a lot of people, uh, um, and, and, and this is an illustration of the point that I just made of how these things have two sides. A lot of people in Greece believe that Greece was, in a sense, exploited because it was given all these uh, money without, in a sense, really taking all of it out of it. There was a lot of corruption on top of it. But people miss the fundamental point which I just made. By having the city of London lend Greece before it became independent, Greece acquired, in a sense, a constituency with a fundamental interest in pressing for its independence. So what you do with debt, and you know the old adage, that if I owe you a little money, that's my problem, but if I owe you a lot of money, that's your problem, right? <laughs> In a sense, it forces people who, it, it is a sort of marriage that you cannot escape easily. And it forces for adjustments and future compromises and it, that go beyond the financial value of the assets that you, in a sense, gain. Uh, and so Greece was indebted for most of the 19th century. And uh, there is a famous paper uh, by two very well-known economists, uh, Rogoff um, and, and Diamond, I think, arguing uh, that because Greece has suffered from uh, enormous debt throughout its history, that is an example of how not, not to run a country. But my argument goes in the opposite direction. If Greece had never managed either to raise funds in a way that, uh, in retrospect, can be described as reckless, or not attract international attention through the fact that it was indebted to major powers, it would have never achieved political goals that were politically impossible to achieve otherwise. That is, Greece has always used, in a very ironic way, uh, its ability to become dependent economically on larger powers in order to achieve political objectives that otherwise would be impossible to achieve including its very independence. Thank you so much. It's fascinating to hear about how the mechanisms of elections work um, in crises. Um, I have a question about when those mechanisms um, are not transparent enough, what happens then? I mean, obviously, <laughs> we, I don't want to talk about tyrannies or, or that kind of thing, but when you get stuff like fake news, 
I mean, we, we've all seen what's happened with uh, elections in the US and the controversy over that. Um, and we also have similar issues in Canada with fake news. Uh, again, that's a very uh, complex issue. Uh, the problem of fake news, I think, is associated uh, with um, technological changes in the, uh, in, the, in the field of communication that cannot be easily absorbed by political systems. People had similar kinds of concerns uh, with the rise of mass, the mass press. Remember the, you know, how the United States went to war in Cuba in the 19th century. Then the same concerns about the rise of the radio. Then the same concerns about the rise of television. And obviously fake news today is very much associated with the internet and, and social media. There is no question that new technologies change the way political systems operate and how elections operate. The reason we no longer have mass parties is that mass parties were a mechanism that was very much adapted to the period of, of mass press, of the mass newspapers. Uh, television led to um, the sort of, um, you know, very, very highly financed politics. So certainly there is an effect, but also there is a part uh, of the effect that people very often feel threatens the very foundations of, of the institutions that goes away once institutions learn how to adapt to the new technologies. Now, of course, what is happening is the speed with which technology changes. <coughs> Forces, in a sense, political institutions are much slower to adapt to those changes. But at the same time, I wouldn't want to go to the other extreme and say that institutions are completely hijacked by those changes. They also learn to adapt. Political parties, politicians, various constituencies find ways, in a sense, to mitigate uh, those, the, the, the more extreme effects. I, I would say that, for example, compared to 10 years ago, you, you remember the, uh, the joke, it is true because I saw it on the internet. Uh, people are no longer as naive about what they see. Of course, you know, there is still a problem, but people who lie or who spread fake news have to be much more sophisticated about it. Uh, the other thing is that uh, information and communication is only one part of the puzzle uh, of how you get, say, to uh, political outcomes and to public policies and there is much more going on than that alone. So again, my answer is a bit open-ended, uh, open but insofar as we can judge from the past, what we see is again this process of adaptation. And we will make this uh, the last uh, question for this session so that we can get everyone to the Words, where uh, we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have a question about Brazil. Uh, we're looking forward to the election on Sunday. Um, and I just wanted to, at the risk of ans asking a yes or no question, um, do you think um, this is, good, this is we're basically running through your scenario? Um, we had voters vote out the Workers' Party uh, when they voted in Bolsonaro, and then now the fringe outside, fake outsider character um, has had his time in power and, um, and now, you know, we're voting again for democracy, basically. Um, and also, I wonder to what degree a pattern of re-election, which we've seen with Trump also, um, like the failure to be re-elected is part of, uh, of the scenario that you just presented. Um, yeah. And, and I want to thank you also for the, for the Hollywood ending, like, you know, just the, the feel-good story of this. <laughs> Well, it's a feel-good story that nobody, uh, that nobody tells because, uh, as I said, once the news moved to, to the other, you know, so, you know, other problematic source, everyone forgets about it. But it, it's very good that you are bringing in Brazil because uh, I remember, you know, when Bolsonaro was elected, there was concern that this would be, again, the last elections, that, you know, things were never going to be the same. And this is another case in which we see that, in fact, you know, this produces... Uh, a necessary, perhaps a necessary, very messy, sometimes a costly, but a necessary process of, of change and renewal in, in which some compromise happens. Elites get also renewed. One of the things that I think makes a lot of uh, sense through these kinds of processes, you get new people, new blood in politics. Uh, and politics is a very, very difficult field. I mean, uh, I mean, you have to be extremely, I guess, uh, 
uh, risk taking, perhaps extremely narcissistic, but to, to run in politics is, is a very difficult uh, job uh, decision uh, for you to, to, to do. And bringing in new people and producing this renewal, I think, is, is something one of the most difficult equations. And one of the, uh, the you know the aspects of the political process, the selection of elite and the selections of people that we know not as much, perhaps. So I would say. I share your, uh, your view about Brazil, and I think uh, if I had to venture uh, a prediction about Italy, I would probably say I wouldn't be extremely worried about the future of Italy. I don't think uh, it's going to move in the direction of uh, you know, dictatorship or anything of that, of that sort. Um, so you know, again, to go back to your point, save an apocalyptic scenario in which you know, this winter becomes, you know, people die of hunger or something along those lines. Sure. My feeling is that um, democratic institutions can manage uh, very, uh, very big shocks that most people thought were not easy to manage or perhaps were impossible to manage. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, very clearly presented uh, uh, run through the uh, Greek experience with perhaps uh, uh, lessons for uh, uh, and suggestions for how to think about uh, uh, global pro uh, problems. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, tonight for uh, for this talk. Uh, keep uh, uh, looking for uh, news announcements on the part of uh, the Stavros Niehaus Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies. Uh, we are trying to be uh, active and. Uh, in, I don't want to say post-COVID because it's not post-COVID, but in a slightly more open kind of environment, uh, we hope to be engaging our audiences uh, uh, much more uh, actively. And please, uh, to the extent that you can, uh, stay with us uh, uh, for the reception where these kinds of conversations can uh, take place in a bit of a more informal uh, uh, fashion. Again, Professor Kalibas, thank you so much for being with us and for this talk.